I work principally as a conceptual artist. Most of my clients are in the defense industry. I occasionally work directly for the military, but most of the time I work for civilian corporations that are defense contractors. They build weapon systems and things for the military. I work for all the major defense contractors. I work for General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northrop, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, Rockwell International, Honeywell, Allied Signal Corporation. Um, and, and it was a very enjoyable, very lucrative business. And just before I went into college um, in 67, when I was at Westover Air Force Base, um, had this uh, Gilbert Science Company 80 power reflector telescope and everything. And um, one night before I was going to go to bed, um, took the dog out, you know, to go to the bathroom and stuff. And it was in March or February of 67. And I saw this light moving across the sky, and then it just kind of stopped, and there wasn't any noise. So I took the dog back in the house, and I brought out my telescope, and I watched this thing through the telescope for about 10 minutes. And then, it, in, in fact, it was hovering directly over the facility where they kept the nuclear weapons, the storage facility near the alert hangars at Westover Air Force Base. And it started to move off, and it, it uh, moved off slowly and kind of wandered around the sky, and then all of a sudden just poof, was gone, like it had been fired out of a gun. It was just out of sight in just a second or two. It all started coming together when I was working at Intervision, and John Eppolito talked about this um, interview that he'd done with a person who had, for some reason, had wound up walking up to or near a hangar at a, um, a section of a military, an Air Force base, and had seen a flying saucer in the hangar, and then he was uh, arrested and hauled off and blindfolded and debriefed and all this sort of thing. This fellow, Mark Stambaugh, apparently, according to uh, Roger Turner, had uh, developed a, an experiment that um, created a kind of levitation. Um, in some circles, it's been called electrogravitic uh, levitation or uh, anti-gravity. And what he did was he uh, apparently acquired a high voltage power source, DC, direct current power source, and he um, took a couple of quarter inch thick uh, copper plates, about a foot in diameter, uh, with a lead coming out of the middle of each one at the top and the bottom, and he basically embedded them in a type of plastic resin like, you know, polycarbonate or plexiglass or some other kind of clear resin where you could see the plates and you could see the material. Uh, apparently did everything he could to get all the little air bubbles and stuff out of there so there wouldn't be any pathways for the electricity to break down the material and arc through there. And the experiment was to see how much voltage you could put on this capacitor. This is a plate capacitor in this arrangement. How much voltage can you put on this thing before the, the insulating material begins to just break down? Well, according to Roger, he got up to about a million volts and the thing would begin to float. But it floated in accordance with principles that have been described in a patent that was filed back in the late 50s, early 60s by a gentleman called uh, Thomas Townsend Brown. He and another uh, individual by the name of um, uh, a Dr. Beefield, he had been a student of this Dr. Beefield, and it became this effect became known as the Beefield Brown effect. Well, he uh, apparently. Uh, duplicated the experiments done by Beefield and Brown, but the, the, the one uh, aspect that they found about the, this, this arrangement was that the levitation would always occur, or movement would occur, in the direction of the positively charged plate. So if you had two plates, one's negative, one's positive because it's a direct current system. And if you have the positive plate on top, it would move in that direction. If you had it on a pendulum, it would always swing in the direction of whatever direction the positive plate was facing. Um, Beefield Brown had even done some experiments in the 50s where he had put a couple of these type of capacitors on a uh, like a little um, uh, pivoting point. And these things would spin as you charge them. I got a call from a kid that I had known at Art Center, a fellow by the name of Brad Sorensen, 
And he apparently had seen the magazine, recognized my name, and uh, contacted the art director who gave my phone number, and he called me up. And uh, it turned out that uh, he had um, gone to work for a design firm in the Glendale, Pasadena area of California. Um, ultimately wound up acquiring most of the clientele for this particular agency. Um, in the process, it developed a um, sort of a business practice where he would create products, conceptual designs, and products for different clients. And the way he structured his business, he would set it up so that if he came up with some new and novel design, something that was patentable, the client would pay to have the patent secured, and then he would agree, if the patent was in his name, he would agree, agree to license it exclusively to them and no one else, and then they would pay him royalties. So he got the, his clients to pay for all his patents, and then he had all these royalties coming in, and he was a millionaire before 30. And this is, so this is Brad Sorensen coming back to me, you know, eight years after school, and we're talking, and he's telling me all these interesting stories. And uh, so I, I, there was an air show that was coming up, uh, out at uh, Norton Air Force Base, which um, used to be an active Air Force Base right on the eastern fringe of San Bernardino in Southern California. It's about 50 to 70 miles outside of Los Angeles, due east of Los Angeles, right along, uh, or just north of Interstate 10. And um, uh, I suggested that we get together and go to this air show, and I'd heard that they were going to have a, um, a flyby or a flying demonstration by the SR-71 Blackbird, and he seemed to know a lot about that, so I said, well, let's, let's do that. Well, it turned out the last minute the, the magazine, Popular Science, came back again and, and said that they had some really, really crazy deadline for another illustration. They wanted to know if I could do it over the weekend, have it finished by the following Monday or Tuesday. Um, so I had to, to beg off on this air show. But Brad had already made arrangements to go uh, by himself. And he was going to meet me there, but he was going to bring one of his clients with him. And it turned out that this client um, was a, a tall, thin, um, a uh, white-haired man with glasses, with an Italian-sounding last name, um, and uh, was already a millionaire in his own right. He was in civilian life again after having been um, uh, either a Secretary of Defense or an Undersecretary of Defense. But Brad wanted me to meet this gentleman. And if I'd known this at the time, I probably would have told the magazine to wait, because I had no idea at that point what I was going to be missing out on. And believe me, I've kicked myself ever since because the following week after Brad uh, um, got back home and called me up and told me about the air show, he told me about what he had seen there. And apparently right about the time that um, the, um, the Air Force flying demonstration team, the, uh, the Thunderbirds, uh, were planning to um, begin their show, this gentleman that Brad was with said, follow me, and they go walking down to the other end of the airfield away from where the crowds were to this huge hangar. It's um, at Norton Air Force Base. I, I don't remember the building number, but it's it's got to be one of the largest hangars um, in the Air Force inventory. In fact, on the base, it was called the big hangar. It looks like four giant Quonset hut styled hangars that are all connected in the middle with shops and work areas out around the edges and there's sort of a divider in the middle but they can they can work on several of these C5s uh, in these hangars all at the same time they can just drive them right in underneath the roof with their tail sticking out you know the the doors and uh, work on them inside away from the weather and the heat um, so this gentleman took Brad down there and there was a cordon of military police around the hangar and he walked up to one and he said um, you know, what do you want? Why are you here? And he says, I'm here to talk to uh, the guy who's running the show. And um, so the guard goes in, and out comes uh, the same guard with uh, a gentleman in a three-piece suit who immediately recognizes this, this fellow that, uh, that Brad is with, this, this fellow who I speculate was probably Frank Carlucci. They go inside, and immediately after getting inside the door, this, this fellow apparently... Um, passes Brad off as his aide. 
to this this uh, fellow who's um, managing this exhibit that's going on inside this hangar. And this exhibit is for um, some of the local politicians who are secured for or cleared for high security information and some of the uh, the local military officials. Um, now it just so happens that at that very same time I had a, a, a really good relationship with the Air Force Art Program and the Public Affairs Office for the Air Force in Los Angeles. The fellow who headed up that office at the time was a colonel by the name of Thomas Hornung. It's H-O-R-N-U-N-G. I believe he's retired now in Florida somewhere. But um, it was a, a short, short fellow. I think he was probably about five five. He he met he sort of met the minimum standards to get into the military because of his height. But very nice fellow, and I believe that uh, he was probably the individual who uh, did a lot of interfacing with the services to make this show happen, along with the assistance of um, at that time Cur um, Congressman George E. Brown Jr., who at the time was the uh, chairman of the um, uh, Congressional Committee on Space Science and Advanced Technology. So you see all these things coming together and then when you hear what Brad described in the hanging, you start to understand why it was so significant. Well, as soon as they walk in, Brad is told by this fellow that he's with, there's a lot of things in here that I didn't expect they were going to have on display, stuff you probably shouldn't be seeing, so don't talk to anybody, don't ask any questions, just keep your mouth shut, smile and nod, but don't say anything, just enjoy the show. We're going to get out of here as soon as we can. So in the process, the host or the, the person running the show was very engaging to or with the, the, the gentleman that Brad was with. And so they bring them in and they're showing them everything. And in the process of this, this, this exhibit, they had a, a number of, um, I guess you'd call them high-tech uh, advanced technology hovercraft that employed different types of uh, little trap doors that would open and thrust would come out and blow them around and you could fly you know several feet off the ground with these things. There was the um, losing prototype from the B-2 stealth bomber competition. They also had um, uh, what was called the um, the, the Lockheed Pulsar, uh, nicknamed the Aurora, and it was described as being a, a large, sort of a flattened out football shape, all black, all covered with um, tiles, very much like the space shuttle, had um, three landing, or had two, um, two large uh, main gear underneath the aircraft, uh, two tires on each side, and a long spindling spindly sort of um, uh, uh, nose gear under the, uh, the nose, very, very long. Um, it didn't appear to have a cockpit of any kind. It instead had a kind of uh, synthetic vision system. It looked like a couple of those little mirrored balls that you see on the lawns back east in New England um, on either side. And these were infrared seeker heads. And he was north of what later became known as the Area 51 um, weapons range. It's north of Las Vegas in Nevada. Um, said that he came out of the clouds um, middle of the afternoon and below him and to his left was this this black diamond shaped aircraft flat foot and football shaped flattened football shape uh, that, but this one had a cockpit on a little canopy had um, a vertical stabilizer above and vertical stabilizer below and it had a couple of little um, like NACA ducts for the inlets for the air for the jet engines and then a couple little openings in the back, kind of like the ones on the stealth fighter, you know, where they, they spread the exhaust stream out so that it disperses the heat, allows the heat signature of the plane to be dropped off dramatically so they're not susceptible to heat seeking missiles and things of that kind. But he, this pilot, in recounting the story to Hal McCormick, says that he called his ground controller and said, why didn't you tell me there's other traffic in my area? Why didn't you tell me? that there's somebody else here. And they said, well, because there is nobody else there. And he said, well, the hell there isn't. I can see him right here, and the plane looks like this. It's black and diamond-shaped and has two tails. And with that, this thing banked away from him, hit the afterburners, and took off and disappeared in the clouds. And the next thing that happened was he got a call from the ground control unit, which just happened to be the tower at Nellis Air Force Base, and it said, 
divert to Nellis, land, stay in the aircraft, don't depart the aircraft. Someone will meet you there. So he immediately diverted to Nellis, um, landed the plane, waited until some MPs came out, and they took him out of the plane, handcuffed him, put him in the plane, and then they spent several days talking to him about the aircraft that he did not see. And so this all kind of came full circle for me, but the, the thing that Brad said when he described this uh, Aurora type aircraft in this hangar along with these other unusual vehicles was that uh, it employed a very unusual kind of technology. That it had two propulsion systems, not just one. That there were engines inside the fuselage of the aircraft that had trap doors that would open up so that it could fly using these internal engines and then when it would get up to say two and a half or three times the speed of sound where the air coming over the top of this aircraft is compressed and superheated and really really hot forming the shock wave coming off this aircraft that they had a way of closing all of these exhaust chutes and these inlets for these these I guess there were four engines inside the aircraft and there was an external type of pulse detonation engine that would operate and, and there was a kind of shallow ridge that ran laterally across the, the, the belly and the backbone of the aircraft at the widest part. There were no wings and no tails on this aircraft that Brad had seen in the hangar. But along this ridge were all these little tiny orifices, these little look like fuel injectors pointing outward in, into the airstream directly behind this ridge. I mean, if it flew this way, the, they would point towards the back. And the idea was that as a supersonic shock wave would form over the front of the aircraft and it would separate from the surface of the aircraft right where that little ridge was, they would spray fuel into the superheated, highly compressed air and it would explode. It would spontaneously explode. And as it did so, it would expand between the tapered afterbody of the vehicle and the shock wave that came off those ridges so it was like an exhaust cone turned inside out and it would pinch the back end of the vehicle and shoot it forward at speeds of something like 10 or 15,000 miles an hour. Just incredible, faster than a rifle bullet basically. Um, and that was part of the reason the whole thing was covered with these ceramic tiles is to protect it from melting when it's flying through the air. The other thing that he said about that aircraft was that it had these circular launch tubes in the belly of the vehicle, uh, each of which carried um, a single cone-shaped nuclear-powered or conventionally, uh, conventionally uh, loaded um, a warhead in a reentry vehicle that could be guided into precision and individually guided to targets. And the way the system operated was, was just absolutely beautiful and elegant and simple. And it, they, they had a tile on the outside with um, explosive bolts holding it in place and it was flush with the, the tiles on the belly of the vehicle and up inside this tube was this this cone-shaped re-entry vehicle pointing nose down um, possibly having a kind of a sabot or a, a three-piece spacer in there that would hold it centered in the tube and then directly above that and behind it was another circular tile and then behind that was a big coiled spring and what they would do is they would fire off the explosive bolts, the spring would push this reentry vehicle out of the tube, the sabot would fly away in pieces, the thing would stabilize in the airstream. If you ever want to see this, take a piece of paper and curl it up into a little cone, put a little like a, uh, a fishing weight in the nose and toss it out the window of your car when you're doing 60 miles an hour and it stabilizes just perfect and then it, you know, it'll fly away from the car. But that's how they would launch these things, and then the spring would slam this tile down into place, and instantly you'd have perfect aerodynamic efficiency again, in just a fraction of a second. So you could spit these things out, the tiles, you know, probably explode when the explosive bolts go off. The sabot was probably fiberglass something, you know, that would be harmless coming back through the, um, through the atmosphere, because they fly at extremely high altitudes. Um, but these things had the ability to be just about anywhere in the world in 30 minutes after launch with the capability of 121 nuclear, you know, probably 10, 15 megaton weapons, a tactical type nuclear reentry vehicle. Um, and then there was the question about how many of them were made. So uh, 
this this aircraft has been seen on a number of occasions, particularly coming in and out of Beale Air Force Base, which is up near, uh, I think it's Modesto, or uh, actually I think it's uh, northeast of Sacramento. Um, and it used to be the big base for the SR-71 Blackbird, which eventually was sort of decommissioned. One day when I was talking with the people at Lockheed, uh, particularly a gentleman by the name of Tom Keaton, who was working in their Calabasas division at that time, that's where all the meetings were, were in Cali their, their facility in Calabasas, California. Um, he said that um, they were developing this artwork as a new version of an existing aircraft. And he went on to describe this existing aircraft as being one that had two propulsion systems. He didn't describe what it looked like. But what he said was that they had had a recent problem with the operation of this, this first generation aircraft. He didn't call it, you know, the F-19 or the Aurora or anything, just said it had two propulsion systems. But he said that the pilot was going to land at a facility north of Nellis Air Force Base in the desert, that the weather apparently was bad, he was going to divert to Edwards, and then he had a problem transitioning from one kind of propulsion system to the other. Didn't specify what they were, but of course this all comes later when you hear what Brad had to say about what he saw in the hangar at Norton Air Force Base. So, but he said, this Tom, Thomas Keaton said, that the aircraft had to fly out over the Pacific, and because it was flying so fast, he had to make a big sweeping arc while he sorted out this problem, transitioning from one propulsion system to the other. And by the time he was ready to turn around with the corrections made and come back, he was over Hawaii, and it was only 15 minutes later. Well, it's 3,000 miles from the coast of California to Hawaii. 15 minutes, that means he was doing 12,000 miles an hour, at least, to make that distance in that amount of time. So obviously, you know, I mean, then there were all of these stories about uh, what people thought were double sonic booms or earthquakes or something, that when you tr tracked all the seismic activity over Los Angeles, there was this perfect pathway going over Los Angeles that crossed or basically made a, a connect the dots kind of illustration between um, the Pacific Ocean, Los Angeles, Edwards Air Force Base, um, a facility that Lockheed had near Bakersfield, which I, I can't remember recall the name of now, and then of course uh, the Area 51 facilities north of Nellis Air Force Base. So it was like they had three options of where they could land. Edwards, this other interim facility that Lockheed had, and then uh, Area 51. So getting back to Brad's story at Norton Air Force Base, one of the other things that he said was that after they showed them all of this aircraft and all these little hovercraft and the flying wing and all this thing, he said they had a big black curtain that divided the hangar into two, two different areas and that behind these curtains was another big area and inside this area they had um, you know all the lights turned off and they go in, they turn the lights on and here are three flying saucers floating off the floor, no cables suspended from the ceiling holding them up, no landing gear underneath, just floating, hovering above the floor. And they had little exhibits, they had a TV, a little uh, videotape running showing the smallest of the three vehicles sitting out in the desert, presumably uh, over a dry lake bed at some place like Area 51, and it, uh, it showed this vehicle making um, three little quick hopping motions like that and then accelerating straight up and out of sight until you couldn't see it and completely disappearing from view in just a couple of seconds. I mean just boom, no sound, no sonic boom, nothing. Um, they had a cutaway illustration pretty much like the one I'll show you in a little bit that showed what the internal components of this vehicle were and they had some of the panels taken off so you could actually look in and see oxygen tanks and a little robotic arm that could extend out from the side of the vehicle for collecting samples and things. So obviously this is a vehicle that not only is capable of flying around through the atmosphere but it's also capable of going out to space and collecting samples. And it's using a type of propulsion system that doesn't make any noise. As far as he could see it had no moving parts. Um, and 
didn't have any exhaust gases or fuel to be expended. It was just there, hovering. Um, so he listened intently and collected as much information as he could. And when he came back, he, he told me how he'd seen these three flying saucers in this hangar at Norton Air Force Base on uh, November 12, 1988. It was a Saturday. Um, and uh, he said that the smallest was uh, somewhat bell-shaped. They were, they were all identical in shape and proportion, except that there were three different sizes. The smallest, at, at, its, at its widest part, flat on the bottom, somewhat bell-shaped, had a dome or like a half of a sphere on top, and then a little ledge around that, and then sloping sides uh, uh, like a skirt, and then the flat bottom. And the sides were sloping at about a, oh, I'd say about a 35 degree angle from pure vertical. And the panels that were around that skirt were what had been removed so that he could see, you know, these big oxygen tanks inside. And he was very specific in describing the oxygen tanks as being about 16 to 18 inches in diameter, about six feet long. And they were all radially oriented like the spokes of the wheel. But this dome that on, was visible on the top was actually the upper half of a, a big sphere-shaped crew compartment that was in the middle of the vehicle. And around the widest, around the middle of this vehicle, this, this ledge that was perceived when you could see, just see the outside of this vehicle, was actually a, a large um, plastic casting that had a, this, this big set of copper coils in it. Uh, I said it was about uh, 18 inches wide at the top, about uh, 8 to 9 inches thick, had, um, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 stacked layers of copper coils inside of it. And then the bottom of the vehicle was about maybe, oh, 11 or 12 inches thick. And in, in both cases, the coil and this, this large disc at the bottom were like a big, plastic casting, sort of a greenish, a greenish blue clear plastic or even maybe it might have been glass. Uh, and embedded in the plastic were the coils in the section that was above, the ring that was above around the, the spherical shaped crew compartment. But then down below were these copper plates and they were divided up into 40, well later I determined using my conceptual artist skills, determined there were exactly 48 sections like thin slices of pizza pie and each section within this casting, one big piece casting, 24 feet in diameter, probably weighed four or five tons, easy. Judging by the thickness and the diameter, it must have been monstrous in weight. Full of half inch thick copper plates. Each, each of the 48 sections had eight copper plates. The plates were half an inch thick and then the spacing in between them was like, um, you know, 125 percent the thickness of the, the plates. It was uh, about three quarters of an inch. So if the half inch thick plates, three quarters of an inch of this dielectric material in between, this, this insulating material. So here we are back to the plate capacitors again and the, and the prospect of someone finding a way to use the B-field Brown effect, this levitation effect where you charge a capacitor and it lifts towards the positive plates. Now when you got eight plates stacked up in there, they alternate. It goes negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive four times. So you ultimately wind up with the positive plates always being above a set of negative plates, you know, as you go up. The interesting thing about it was the outer edge of this disc that supported the, the capacitor, it was milled off at the same 35 degree angle as the rest of the vehicle, as was the edge of this ring that supported the coils. On the inside of the crew compartment was a big column that ran down through the middle and there were uh, four ejection seats mounted back to back on the upper half of this column and then right in the middle of the column was a large like a flywheel of some kind. Well the synthetic vision system that's on the AR, what they called the alien reproduction vehicle, it was also nicknamed the flux liner. Uh, this is this, this anti-gravity propulsion system, this, this flying saucer, one of three that were in this hangar at Norton Air Force Base. This synthetic vision system uses the same kind of technology as the, the gun slaving system that they have in the Apache helicopter, except in this case you have two cameras and it picks any pair of the cameras in that pattern of six that are around the circumference, including the one on the top, whichever 
pair most closely matches the orientation of the pilot's head. So if he wants to look behind him, he can pick, pick a view in that direction. The cameras slew in pairs, and he has a little screen in front of his helmet, and it gives him an alternating view. He has uh, like a little, uh, a little set of glasses that he wears, and uh, in fact, you can, you can actually buy a 3D um, viewing system for your video camera now that does the same thing. And what it does is it uses a beam splitter, which sends part of light one way and then part of it at a right angle and offsets it by about six inches. And then it has an electronic shutter in there that uses these, these uh, like a liquid crystal type material that darkens and becomes transparent at intervals of about 60th of a second or a 30th of a second. And so the cameras, as they're looking around, are giving him a right-left, right-left view. And the goggles, the things that he's wearing, he has two little projection screens inside his helmet. And they both project, well, two cameras, but one projection screen. And the glasses have that special blocking device that allows one eye to see and then the other eye to see. And at the same time, the cameras are projecting right view, left view, right view, left view. But they're doing it at like 30 frames a second. And so when he looks around, he has a perfect 3D view of the outside, but no windows. So why do they have no windows? Well, it's probably because the voltages that we're talking about used in this system, similar to the experiments that were done by Mark Stambor, probably something between, say, a half a million and a million volts of electricity. Brad said a couple things about this system. Now, I should also describe, he said there were three vehicles. The first one, the smallest one, the one was partially taken apart, the one that was shown in the video that was running in this hangar, November 12, 1988, at Norton Air Force Base, was about 24 feet in diameter at its widest part, right at the base of that flange. The next biggest one was 60 feet in diameter at the base. And based on the calculations that I did, um, and it's, it's a shame that we don't have the, uh, the, the material that I sent to Leslie Kane because I had one of Brad's original quick little drawings that he did for me to show me what it was he saw and then based on all the dimensions and everything that he gave me I went home and plotted it all out figured out all the sizes, the angles and everything and when I was done I came up with this this particular illustration right here this shows this shows the cutaway. You can see the uh, the uh, four ejection seats. Actually, there there are two facing us, but there are also two that are sort of facing away from us on the other side of that central column. You can see the uh, the oxygen tanks down here in the corner uh, that that actually go all the way around the inside of the skirt. Uh, there's also another set of oxygen tanks that are inside the uh, the crew compartment sphere, and then. Um, Let's see here. Right in this area here is uh, the uh, the large flywheel type mechanism that's right at the center of this this uh, device. And then around the circumference here, you can see this ring. That, okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that. You can see the ring that's basically the coils. Now, I started looking at the design of this thing, and it occurred to me that what what I was looking at there was a huge Tesla coil, which is kind of like an open air transformer. You take a large diameter coil with a few heavy large diameter windings of copper coil. Uh, coil. It's like a, a big, like a donut shaped coil or a toroidal coil is what it's called, a toroid, like a donut. And you say have maybe a hundred windings in this coil. And then in the middle of that coil, you have a column with several hundred windings, maybe a much finer wire. But what happens is when you throw electricity on this large diameter coil, it creates a field. And the field is itself shaped like a big invisible donut. And the, the field lines in this, in this toroidal or donut shaped field that's around the, the electrified coils, the, the field lines are all in planes that are radially oriented, just like the capacitors. And so what happens is you have uh, a transformer. You put a certain amount of electricity on the few windings in the large diameter coil. And what they do is they induce, through inductance is the electrical term, they induce a much higher voltage of electricity 
on these many, many windings that are on that central column. It's like a transformer. You get step up or step down, which means you can go from, say, a low voltage with a very high amperage or amount of electricity flowing through the wires, and you can change that to a very high voltage with low amperage or a low amount of, of actual voltage, but the potential, the punch behind it, the voltage, is much, much higher. And that's what this system does, is it takes electricity, according to Brad, two large 24-volt marine-style batteries, these deep, uh, deep, uh, deep charge type marine batteries that they use on, you know, these big boats in the military and stuff. You, you uh, basically use that to somehow put an alternating current through these windings. You step up that electricity through the secondary coil that's on the column in the middle you get this extremely high voltage. You can selectively put the voltage on any of these 48 capacitor sections. Well, why would you want to do that? I mean, if you're using just a, a normal Tesla coil, you usually only have maybe one or two capacitors in the whole system. But you're talking about a different type of capacitor here. You're talking about capacitors that are made up of plates, plates that are shaped like long, thin triangles. And they're all radially oriented, just like the spokes of the wheel, just like the oxygen tanks, just like the field lines from that large diameter coil. So you begin to realize as you look at this system, if you're an electrician or you just somebody knows a little bit about Tesla coils and the way that they're set up, you begin to realize that the orientation of the components is really the key to making the system work. Why so many different capacitor sections? Well, Okay, if you just have one big disk like Mark Stambau did with his experiment at the University of Tucson, which, by the way, was confiscated by men claiming to be from the government that were claiming privilege under the National Security Act. They took all his stuff, interviewed all of the people that saw the experiments, told everybody to keep their mouth shut and not talk about it. But I heard about it from his roommate who knew what had happened. But in that case, you just get levitation, but you don't get any control. You have this thing floating around, and it's just sort of floating on, you know, whatever this field is that it's producing. But you don't have any control. So what happens? You break that, that disk up into 48 individual sections, and then you can decide how much electricity you want to put on this side or over there on that side. And so you control the amount of electricity, the amount of thrust and vectoring that you get. You can make the thing roll around like a coin about to come to stop after you flick it onto a desk. You can make it go straight up. You can make it bank and turn, yawn, pitch, whatever you want to, by virtue of the fact that you can control where the electricity goes in those 48 different sections. And if you ever take a circle and you divide it up into 48 equal sections, you'll find that those are really thin little slices. I mean, they're like maybe one-tenth or one-twelfth of the kind of typical wedge you get when somebody slices you a piece of pie, a pizza, you know, or something. But anyway, so you have this capacitor, or these 48 individual capacitors, and you have one big Tesla coil. So you've got to have some kind of a rotating spark gap, just like the distributor in your car, that sends the electricity out to each of those sections. And then you have to have some way of controlling how much electricity goes to each one. So, but the system explains itself in a way, because you've got four sets, four pairs, of plates, you know, four sets of one positive, one negative, times 48 sections. So what do you do? You have your spark gap set up so that if you want to have only a little bit of electricity on this one particular capacitor module, you only charge two of the plates in the stack. You want a little bit more on the one next to it, you charge four. You want a lot, you charge six. And if you want the maximum thrust from that one particular module, you charge all eight. So that's how they can control it subtly they can get it to do whatever they want to. Now Brad when he described the control system said that on the one side there was this big high voltage what they call a potentiometer it's like a like a a rheostat like a big controller it, it allows you to pro put pro progressively more electricity through the system as you as you push the lever. Now on the other side of the control system there was a um, sort of a metallic bar that came up like a like a kind of like a, a stork's neck and at the top of it or right at the, the very tip of it was a sort of metallic looking ball 
Well, attached to that ball was a kind of a bowl that seemed to just hang off the bottom of that ball, it just almost like it was magnetically attached to it. And he said that the system, when you really, when you watched it as you were standing next to it, he said the whole thing would just sit there and it would kind of rock and list, almost like a large ship at anchor in the ocean at a harbor, you know, floating on the water, literally on a sea of energy, as I think it was. Uh, um, uh, um, it was uh, as, um, uh, Dr. Moray did experiments with um, different kinds of uh, energy, something that may have been scalar energy up in Utah back in the, uh, the 20s or the 30s, I believe it was. But he, taught, he wrote a book called The Sea of Energy, and he describes this type of energy. And Brad said that when this thing was moving around, that the system wasn't energized to its full strength, and so components inside of the ship were still subject to some influence by gravity. And he says as it would start to list in one direction, that bowl, because of the influence of gravity, would swing in the same direction as it started to tilt. It would, it would slide over and it would power up the system on that side and it would bring it back to a righted position. All by itself, completely unmanned, it would sit there and it would correct itself just while it was sitting there. Well, not too long ago, about two years ago, I came across an article in, um, um, I think it was uh, NASA's publication called Tech Briefs. And in this, in this system, in, in, this, in this article, in, in this one of these issues, I found a system that had been designed and patented by a couple of scientists working at Caltech in Pasadena under contract with, I believe it was a jet propulsion laboratory in NASA, and they had developed a whole computerized network of sensors and systems and computers that was all linked fiber optically. Well, why would that make any difference? Why would you want to have a system that's all linked fiber optically? And the reason is, is that if you find a way to control gravity and maybe reduce the mass of a vehicle, the, the very thing that makes it float, if you find a way to reduce the mass of that vehicle and propel it at ungodly speeds, like in the video where Brad said it hopped three times and then pew, took off like a shot, if you're able to do that, then what are the other side benefits of that? If you've somehow found a way of tapping into this, this scalar field, this zero-point energy. If what the scientists believe is true, that the zero-point energy is actually what keeps the electrons around the atomic structure of everything in our universe, so it keeps them energized, it keeps those little electrons spinning in their different clouds around the nucleus of every atom in our world, keeps them going, keeps them from crashing into the nucleus like a satellite orbiting the Earth that gets pulled into the atmosphere by gravitational drag. Well, if you have a way of interfering with that interaction, that absorption of zero-point energy by those electrons, then they begin to slow down. And every atom in the universe is just like a little gyroscope. It's got all these electrons spinning around the nucleus, and they have kind of a gyroscopic effect, which is the effect we call inertia and mass. You have one nucleus with a proton and neutron and one electron, helium, or excuse me, hydrogen, you know, spinning around like that. No, not very much mass, not too much inertia. But you take uranium-235 with 235 electrons all spinning around in their different clouds. There's a lot of mass there, a lot of inertia. It's because it's like a bigger gyroscope in a way. I mean, it's, that's the, the analogy that I've kind of picked up here. But if you have a way of interfering with that absorption of zero-point energy so those electrons become de-energized, they begin to slow down, the effect of that inertia, that gyroscopic effect, begins to drop off and the mass drops off too. Even though the atomic structure is intact, even though it's still there, it's still uranium, but it's not as heavy. One of the things that Einstein said was that you could never accelerate anything up to and past the speed of light. Because if you did so, you would have to have all the energy in the universe because as you accelerate through space, mass increases. And one of the old films showing this concept shows a train going faster and faster towards the speed of light, but the train keeps getting bigger and bigger and longer until the engine just can't pull it, so it can't ever pass the speed of light. But what if, what if you have a system, a, a, a device, that absorbs that zero-point energy and prevents it from interacting with the atomic structure of your vehicle? and at the same time is providing additional power to the capacitor section, these, this, this whole electrical system that's going on in the vehicle, that's running 
what happens is that as you go faster, as you accelerate, all of that added energy which would keep those electrons spinning faster and faster and increasing the mass like Einstein described, that same energy would be converted into thrust. But it's not allowed, it's not, it's not being channeled in a way that allows it to interact with the atomic structure of the vehicle and make it get heavier and more massive, have more inertia. So the faster you go, literally, the faster you are able to go because you're tapping all that energy which would otherwise increase your mass, just like Einstein said. So in effect, the faster you go, the easier it gets to, the easier it becomes to, to go up to and exceed the speed of light. Now, Brad said that in this exhibit at Norton Air Force Base that a three-star general said that these vehicles were capable of doing light speed or better. Oh, by the way, and the largest of three vehicles was about 120 to 130 feet in diameter. I mean, that's, that's massive when you think about it. It's just huge. There is a, a scientist in Utah by the name of Maury B. King. He's written a book called Tapping the Zero Point Energy. And what he maintains is that this energy is embedded in space-time all around us. It's in everything we see. I think it was, uh, I don't know, was it was James, James Clerk Maxwell speculated that there's enough of this this flux, this electrical charge in, in the nothingness of space, that if you could capture all the energy that was embedded in just a cubic yard of space, that you'd have enough energy to boil the oceans of the entire world. That's how much energy is sitting there waiting to be tapped. Now one of the things that Maury B. King said was that the best way to tap that energy is by driving it out of equilibrium. It's just like a bunch of cigarette smoke in a box. But if you somehow send a shockwave through it, you can get a force. You can get ripples through it. And then if you have a way of collecting that energy at the other end, you have a way of tapping into it and using it. Now, one of the ways that they believe you can actually demonstrate the existence of this force is something called the Casimir effect. This is something that was discovered years ago. I mean, it was probably just before the turn of the century, before you know, 1899 to 1900. And it was described as an experiment where a, a scientist took a couple of heavy steel plates, suspended them on tracks with the faces parallel. And his thinking was that if there's this, this omnidirectional, uh, omnipresent force that's all around us, it's acting on us from all sides, we can't feel anything because it's in equilibrium. But if you create an environment where it becomes channeled in a way, you put two big pieces of steel together like this where their faces become closer and closer, that energy can't get into that little gap in between, but it's pushing on the outer surfaces from all directions. So what happens? You get those places, those two plates close enough together and they slam together very, very hard and they release all kinds of heat in the process. Now, there are a number of scientists that said, well, if you could have some kind of a foliated charge collector that had all these plates stacked up, you know, just a few millimeters apart and get them all to slam together at the same time, you could somehow tap that energy. But apparently, this system here, this, this alien reproduction vehicle, this flux liner, has a way of doing that somehow electronically. Now, Brad had described the fact that this central column has a kind of vacuum chamber in it. And the vacuum chamber is one of the things that you hear all these, these scientists who describe these over unity or free energy devices they build. They all have some kind of vacuum tubes, vacuum technology. Even the Philadelphia experiment where they supposedly made a whole battleship disappear used tons and tons of vacuum tubes, the real big ones they used to have back in the 40s. Well, Brad maintained that inside this, this big vacuum chamber in the central column that's inside of everything else, inside of the flywheel, inside of the secondary coils of this Tesla coil, inside of the, the, you know, the crew compartment, there is this vacuum chamber with mercury vapor in it. Now mercury vapor, uh, metallic mercury, when it becomes a vapor is what they call a noble gas. It will conduct electricity. But it produces all kinds of ionic effects. It, these, these little uh, molecules of mercury become charged in unusual ways and if you fire a tremendous amount of electricity through mercury vapor that's in a partial vacuum there's something special something unusual that happens in that process and I believe it's the process that Maury King described when he said driving the energy in the vacuum out of equilibrium putting some kind of a shockwave through it you know sending a big electrical charge through there you know like 
like one of those plasma spheres you see you touch them and the little lightning bolts come over and touch the side where you touch it with your fingers and stuff the same kind of thing but in a very controlled very directional kind of way now the other thing that I believe happens here is that as this system begins to tap into this zero point energy and is drawing it away from the local environment the whole craft becomes lighter in weight it becomes partially mass cancelled if you will which is one of the reasons why just a little bit of energy on the capacitors can shoot it all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now I talked about this article in Tech Briefs where they were developing a whole system that was all linked by fiber optics that allows you to evaluate and control computers and different systems. Well one of the things that I believe that happens is when you take a system like this and you fire it up and everything in the system starts to become mass canceled the next thing that happens is that the electrons that are flowing through the system also become mass canceled. And what does that mean? It means that as that system and all the electrons flowing through that, that big Tesla coil become mass canceled, it also becomes the perfect superconductor, which means the efficiency of the system goes pew, right through the ceiling. So you get dramatic efficiency, just like the whole thing was dunked into liquid nitrogen or, or made out of pure silver or pure gold, you know, which at certain temperatures are perfect conductors. You have all these, these, these fields being induced. And one of the things that happens is that because these fields around that main coil are all, they have the field lines that are radially oriented, just like the capacitors in the bottom of the craft. I believe that what happens is you, you wind up on a, on a very microscopic sale, scale, you, you wind up with the same thing that you have in that little toy I described earlier, the Newton's cradle where the little ball bearings go back and forth, except in this case, You've got all this electrical potential, all these electrons that are sitting in the capacitor sections. And those electrons are all lining up on the field lines. They're just like a bunch of soldiers standing there getting ready to march off to war. They're all in single file lines. And every time you hit those capacitors and the electrons with a pulse of electricity from the Tesla coil, you create longitudinal waves, the same scalar waves that we talked about way back in the beginning. And I believe that what you do there is you're creating an effect like, in a, like a barrier in a way that, that prevents this, this zero point flux from interacting with the atomic structure of the vehicle. And so it becomes lighter and it can be accelerated at incredible speed. In 1992, you know, I described this thing to people that I met and I, I went to an air show at Edwards Air Force Base. It was right after the Persian Gulf War. Uh, I met some friends of mine, one of my clients at Rockwell had some exhibits there and they, they had a friend, a mutual friend, who a fellow by the name of Kent Sellen, S-E-L-L-E-N, who worked for the AIL Corporation. And as it turned out, Kent Sellen uh, and I had a mutual friend. It turned out that he and I both knew a fellow by the name of Bill Scott, or William Scott, who was a, a local uh, editor for a trade publication called Aviation Week and Space Technology. Now, Bill Scott used to be a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base back in the early 1970s. And Kent Sellen had been a crew chief working on the plane that Bill Scott flew. Now, here we were talking about the Persian Gulf War. And in the wake of that particular war, I, I met a young lady that worked at the restaurant where I ate every day. And she was complaining because her husband, who was a Marine, had gone over to the Persian Gulf. And he was over there for six months or a year or something. But he'd write home and he'd tell all these stories about how there were UFOs flying all over the Persian Gulf at night, over the Gulf. They'd see these things zipping around the sky. So I was talking to Kent Sellen about this fellow and describing these things that he had seen when he was a Marine on one of these ships in the Persian Gulf. And he nodded his head and, and smiled a big wry grin and he winked and he kind of said, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I said, well... How do you know what I'm talking about? How do you know what, I, what I'm talking about? And he says, well, because I, I've seen one. And, I said, and at that point, I keyed in on something that John Eppolito of Intervision had told me about something in a hangar, something that someone had seen in a hangar. And then I, I remembered something that a, a young lady who claims to be a UFO abductee, she said she'd met a young lady who was in the Air Force, worked at Edwards Air Force Base. Her husband was a security guy that worked at North Base, which is a facility where they keep all these classified aircraft. And during the Christmas break one year, 
she said that they were all bored and lonely. He was the only guy out there. So he invited her out to North Base in the middle of the night, and he took her around and he showed her all these classified aircraft in these hangars, and one of them was a flying saucer. And what did it look like? It was flat on the bottom, had slope sides, has a dome on the top with the little plastic bubbles with the synthetic vision system, the whole bit. So I said to Kent, when I'm meeting him at this air show at Edwards in 92, I said, well, um, was it flat on the bottom and had sloping sides and a dome on the top and little bubbles, you know, little camera things? He's, oh, you've seen one. I said, well, let me borrow your pen. So I put, took out a little piece of paper, drew a sketch. I said, did it look like that? He says, yeah, that's it. That's what it looks like. I said, well, so when did you see this? And he says, I saw it in 1973. I said, well, what, where? When, how do you know? What, when did you see it? He says, well, I, I was a crew chief. He said, I worked on Bill Scott's plane when he was a test pilot. And he says, one night my ship supervisor said to me, you know, go out to North Base. They've got a, a, a power unit out there, a ground power unit for an aircraft that's leaking or failed or something. So we need to take a tow vehicle out there, go out, pick it up, bring it back, drop it off at the repair depot. He says, then you can go for the night because we finished all our other work. Well, instead of going around the big perimeter road that goes up to the main entrance of North Base, what this young man did, what Kent Sella did in 1973, one of the same years I was in the Air Force, he drove straight across the dry lake bed at Edwards to the North Base facility, assuming that the security was so tight out there that they would see him coming, you know, with uh, their thermal imaging systems or whatever they had back then, and that they would, the security people would pick him up and say, okay, it's, it's over there, get it and leave. Well, instead, what happened is he comes up off the dry lake bed, rolls right up on the tarmac, and is going down these rows of hangars. They're all Quonset-style hangars back then. And he stops in front of the first one with the doors cracked, expecting to find this defective ground power unit. And what does he see? He sees this flying saucer sitting in the hangar, hovering off the ground, which brings me back to John Apolito's story about a guy who saw a UFO in a hangar in, you know, sometime prior to 1982 when I met him. So, or 19, I guess I met him in 1980, actually. But, but so it starts coming full circle. So I, I, tell, I said, well, what happened? He says, well, this thing, you know, was flat on the bottom, sloping sides, had little cameras in these little plastic domes all over, and there was a door on the side. And he says, I wasn't there for 15 seconds, and I heard footsteps running up to me. And before I could even turn around and look, he says, there was a machine gun barrel at my throat, another one over here. And he says, a gruff voice says, close your eyes and get on the ground, or we're going to blow your head off. So they put a hood over his head, blindfolded him, hauled him off, and they spent 18 hours debriefing him. And while they did, they told him things about this vehicle that my buddy Brad didn't even know, just from what he could see, you know, standing in that exhibit with his eyes closed, you know, with his eyes open, not saying anything. Well, Kent Sellen tells me that the upper and the lower sections of the crew compartment, they're made out of a, uh, what's called a poltruded sphere. It means that you take, uh, you know, a, a uh, composite material like Kevlar or fiberglass or carbon thread and you, you embed it with resin and then you wrap it around a, a ball-shaped mandrel and while it's still wet and all these fibers bind together into a huge highly incredibly strong sphere probably stronger than steel and ca capable of you know holding up to you know machine gun fire everything won't go through it because it's just like a big piece of armor plating but at the same time, they set it up so the top and the bottom halves can be split. And they mold a little flange all the way around on each of those. And that flange is what holds the primary windings of the Tesla coil together. And he said that one of the things that they designed into the system was that if the, you know, the pilots of this thing were at high altitude and they had to eject, there's all this ionized air around the craft that could fry these pilots when they went to eject so they couldn't just pop out of there. He said that they had a series of explosive bolts around the upper and the lower halves of the sphere, and when it came time to eject, the whole top of the sphere would come off and it would pull the outer sheath of that central column along with the ejection seats right out of the vehicle, and it would offer a protective shield around them as they were going up because the flywheel is right underneath their feet. It's this big nine-foot diameter flywheel in the smallest version of the craft. So it would come off. And of course, the charge would start to dissipate, as, dissipate, you know, as this thing flew away. And I even speculated that that in some sense, this 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 bowl-shaped upper section of the crew compartment that they're sitting inside of could even act as a rudimentary re-entry shield if they were coming back down through the atmosphere. But Brad had said that 
that all the components in the system were all off-the-shelf components, things that you could find, you know, right in the inventory. But they have their own uh, oxygen supply, and he says they eject uh, once they get below 15,000 feet, and the individual seats come down off this central column on a set of rails, just like little railroad cars. They come off one by one, and pew, the parachutes come out, and away they go. I looked at all this information that I got from Brad. I saw, you know, re realized there's a mechanical arm that can extend out from you know, these little trap doors that open up on the side of the vehicle. It's obvious that these things are capable of space travel. And then I remembered something that, that he even denies telling me now, but 10, 15 years ago when I was first talking to Tom Bearden, one of the first things that he ever told me when I was talking about scalar effects and you know what it was and what it does and how does it work and are the Soviets weaponizing this technology, all these things that he was speculating about, one of the things that he said just off the top of his head and probably didn't even realize the significance of it at the time, and he since has denied saying it, one of the things that he said was, have you ever wondered why the NASA budget has been cut back so severely? Well, it's because because they've got all this other technology that is so much better, so much faster. I mean, light speed are better? Come on. So much better than rocket-propelled spaceships that take months, sometimes years, to get to the outer reaches of the solar system. Why would you put millions and millions of dollars in, I mean, what, a public works program for scientists? Why invest all that money when you have this system classified system that's used exclusively like probably by the National Security Agency, the CIA, or Air Force Intelligence or something, but it'll go anywhere in the solar system in, in hours compared to months or years. Why spend all that money on NASA when you've got something that'll go there right now? Right now. So when people speculate that there may be a, a, a manned base on the backside of the moon or there might be bases on Mars, I can tell you that I am almost positive that that's true. I, I, in fact, I am positive that it's true. He says, well, he says, um, I work at the B-2 bomber facility out at Plant 42 in Palmdale in Lancaster. And so I've had a tour of that through the Air Force Public Affairs Office. I got a tour of that whole facility. I know right where that is. I've been there. He says, well, then you also probably know that Caddy Corner across from the big production facility for the B-2 bomber, down at the southwest corner of the field is the Lockheed Skunk Works, that huge complex down there. And I said, yeah, I know exactly where that is. He says, well, uh, a year ago, the summer of, this would have been the summer of 1992, he said, after they passed this legislation that said you can't smoke indoors anymore in any government-sponsored building, this kind of thing, he says, I was outside about 10.30 at night because I worked a late shift, and he said, smoking a cigarette, and he said, I noticed that the sheriff's deputies were blocking off all of the streets surrounding Plant 42, and when they do that, and I've since confirmed that they do do that because I got a ticket coming out of that same facility doing some work for, for Rockwell a year and a half later. But the, the sheriff's deputies confirmed that yes, in fact, when any time there's a, a classified aircraft that's coming into land or is departing from Plant 42, they block off civilian traffic and all the surrounding streets so they don't see any of the classified stuff. So he says, I notice all the streets being blocked off. He says, I can see the red and blue lights around the perimeter of the base. And he said that he said, then I noticed that all of the, these big mercury vapor lamps that are around the edge of the roof for the Lockheed Skunk Works all are extinguished. And he said, the, the big bypass doors in front of this huge hangar, it must be like a, between a quarter of a million and half a million square feet. It's a mammoth hangar, probably 12 story tall ceilings, just huge building. The doors are open and sitting out in front of this hangar or is this circular formation of these vehicles, but they're really weird vehicles. They're like these little, it's like a little tractor with a turret on it, and the turret has a big mechanical arm with a basket on the end of it. It's the kind of thing that these electrical linemen use to work on these high, high tension power lines and stuff. But the baskets are all up in the air and strung from each one of them in this big circle is this big black curtain that, that comes down and there's sort of a rope that ties them all together and they're in a circle. And he said that uh, that particular night was a very smoggy summer evening in 1992. And he said in Palmdale, it gets so smoggy up there that the city lights make the sky glow a sort of a dull orange. And he said, I looked up above the circle of vehicle and up above them at about 500 feet was this big black lens-shaped flying saucer just sitting there above the vehicles. And out of the midst of this group of vehicles, 
a man comes out with a big blue-green handheld flashlight, shines it up the vehicle, flashes it three times. He said there are three blue-green lights underneath the vehicle, and they flash at him three times. And then this thing lowers down into this cluster of vehicles. The arms all extend out over the center, cover it all up, and then they all trundle into the hangar. The doors close, the lights come on, the sheriffs leave. Well, he said he smoked a lot of cigarettes for the next week after that, waiting to see something else. And a week later, his, his patience was rewarded. And he said that the whole process reversed itself. He says the lights go out, the doors open, this cluster of vehicles come out, the arms all stand up like this. And he said after a while, he said this thing silently raises up to about 500 feet above the vehicles. The guy comes out with the flashlight, flashes three times, it flashes its lights at him three times. And then he said this thing took off covered the entire length of the runway, which is right next to the B-2 facility, went past him and disappeared into the dark in under two seconds. And he did it, he, this, this vehicle did it without any noise, without any supersonic shockwave, no sonic boom, nothing, just pew, like it had been fired from a cannon. He says, it changed my life. He said, it changed my whole perspective, because he says, then I says, I know they got anti-gravity, he says they got massless propulsion. He says they've got technology that they might have even gotten recovered from some kind of a spacecraft that came from God knows where, some other star system. But he says the fact is they've got it. We go to the patent office and we start looking for patents. And we find patents by Nikola Tesla that all go all the way back to the 1890s that look just like this technology. These big, these energy transmitters, these, these, these uh, Tesla coil type things that he was designing, with, with, which, uh, which also had... Uh, coils, just like the one in the, uh, the alien reproduction vehicle, where th the outer bank of the coils are sloping at an angle, almost like a section cut out of a cone, or a frustrum is what they call it. Then we find a diagram, and this is one of the things that I sent to Leslie Kane that I, I wish we had here now, but there, there was a, uh, a patent, and the patent was filed by a James King Jr., and this patent looks just like the system, except that instead of having a dome for a crew compartment, it has a cylinder in the center of that thing, that same shape, the flat bottom, the sloping sides, has the coils around the circumference, has the, the, the capacitor plates that are all radially oriented. Filed in, uh, initially in 1960, the patent was secured in 1967, the same year that this photo was taken near Provo, Utah. And the clincher is, the guy who filed the patent worked with Townsend Brown. Townsend Brown had worked at a laboratory in near Princeton, New Jersey with a scientist by the name of Agnew Bonson in the Bonson Laboratories. They did all these experiments that they presented this what they were calling electrogravitic propulsion to the Navy. And the Navy basically poo-pooed it, at least according to the, the, uh, the stories. They didn't seem interested and yet on film, there is a film available now. You can get it from uh, Atlantis Rising magazine and a couple other places. There is uh, some, some video that was converted from the 16 millimeter film that was shot by Agnew Bonson's daughter. It originally was called Daddy's Laboratory. And it shows all these experiments that, that Bonson and Thomas Townsend Brown did, along with their assistant, James King, who filed the patent, that show little disks, you know, levitating and shooting off sparks and stuff. And so it, it all kind of comes full circle. You see that not only have they got the technology, they've got the technology in deployment. Not only does it fly, but it looks just like the patents that were filed back in the 60s. The same year that photos were taken near Area 51, between Area 51 and Provo, Utah, by a military pilot. And, and it, it shows all, all the same features, shows all the same shapes. And so the bottom line for me is that, that uh, regardless of whether you you understand all the fine points of the technology. The technology exists. There are people that have seen it. I've seen these things myself. Um, and uh, uh, so it's, to me, it's just really a matter of time before they, they uh, bring this technology out of the black and begin to let us use it for other things like pollution-free production of energy. Big one. Big environmental saver. Um, uh, you could probably take a couple little things that look like those flying saucers and put them around a crankshaft and use them to drive an engine. Pollution-free, no use of fuel. Um, 
probably have to shield it against all the ionization, but you could probably find a way to do it. I'm sure you could find a way to make an, electro, an electrogravitically driven motor, electric motor. Um, the only other thing I can say is that when I was talking about the fiber optic control system, that's also one of the things that goes back to the original Roswell account, that there were all these little fibers with light going through them, and they couldn't explain what this stuff was. Well, well of course we're talking about right, fiber optics. Right. Okay, well, why would you need a fiber optic system in a, in a spaceship? Well, okay, if suddenly everything in the vehicle suddenly becomes mass canceled, and even the electrons become mass canceled, it means that all of the all of the telemetry that's going through your system is going to go out of haywire. It's going to be like suddenly the system goes through a phase change and everything's superconducting. So you have to have some way of maintaining the same level of control for your spark gaps, the control of the amount of electricity that goes out to the different capacitors, so that when you change the control stick, you still get the same amount of movement and deflection in the system, even when you go into a, a, a state of mass cancellation or parcel mass cancellation because the electrons are also mass canceled and so they become superconducting circuits. Well, why use, why use fiber optics? Because photons have no mass, supposedly, so they're unaffected. So it means that any information, any telemetry that you send back and forth to your computer, it doesn't matter if the computer functions at a superconducting level because it just makes it faster, more efficient, smarter, but you want to be able to control the aircraft so it doesn't crash. What's the best way to do it with fiber optics? He specifically said this was a waste of taxpayers' money to have covert operations that have developed advanced technologies in this energy or propulsion area, and then NASA is also getting tax dollars to do the same thing all over again. The parallel development, he felt, was a waste of taxpayers' money. Uh, I've seen other senators say the same thing. In fact, that particular senator requested um, information from the president about such covert operations.